Let's just start over again. Yeah. Okay, so we'll... And they're pretty nice, so we should let them have this okay. pass. Okay. If, if, if Go ahead, be, restart the clock. We'll restart the clock. They had some kind of technical problem, okay. which they have solved. Okay. Here we go. Okay, wait a minute. Oh. And come on. Okay, go ahead. Welcome to Talking Peace with the Western New York Peace Center being produced here at Think Twice Radio in the home of the future, courtesy of our great producer, Richard Wicca. Hi, Richard. Thanks, Richard. So um, I am Vicki Ross. I'm co-hosting the show along with um, our, our very special new executive director, Deidre Email. Hi, Deidre. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. And we're, we're excited to have a very important show today, and um, we're thrilled that we have some very busy and very wonderful people to join us as our special guests, one of them being Reverend Denise Walden. Hi, Denise. Hi. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. It's great to have you. Um, and, and great. You, you're going to add so much to this conversation. Den, uh, Denise, Reverend Denise, is the lead organizer for Live Free which is a program of Voice Buffalo. Um, actually, mm -hmm. we were just hearing a little bit about the history of Voice Buffalo in our previous hour, <laughs> anyway, which is really nice to hear about the origins. But anyway, um, and we also have another special guest and friend of the show, former board member at the Western New York Peace Center and Shiro, General Shiro, Cariel Horn. Hi, Cariel. Hi. Hello. <laughs> hi, hi. Are you and TJ uh, home yet? Or almost? There almost. he is. <laughs> Hi, TJ. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so Cariel, Cariel is a, a pretty, is quite, so it's, you're quite famous as a national news and friend of the show, but just for those who by some chance might not know who you are, I'll just mention that um, Cariel is the officer who was, um, who was, uh, who actually was fired for stopping somebody from doing a chokehold in Buffalo. As former police officer, was fired in um, 2006, and it's been a long road to uh, to to live free. <laughs> and, uh, it's been a long road for recognition of just how wrong and how 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 crazy and criminal that was. So she is finally. Um, she's gotten uh, Cariel's Law adopted, and, you know, she and we, the community, have gotten Cariel's Law adopted in Buffalo. Um, there's initiatives going on um, to have it adopted nationwide, and we're very happy that she's in the process of getting her pension, or long-deserved, much-deserved pension. So welcome, welcome, and uh, hallelujah. So our show tonight, and we're we're expecting to have um, Bishop Geneva Reed Veal, who is Sandra Bland's mom, who's very busy and very wonderful, uh, just uh, uh, such a such a courageous and um, devoted warrior for justice, for her daughter, for the many people who are being crushed in a in a criminal injustice system. Um, and so we're hoping that she's going to come. She's going to come in when she's finished her um, interview that she has with the local paper. But in the meanwhile, um, we wanted to talk, and we will continue to talk about the situation at the Erie County Holding Center and in the um, Alden facility of Erie County. So for the inmates. So. Um, I think maybe what I what uh, before we go there, uh, we were talking about just offering up what are the values that we want to offer up. I would say in this mm -hmm. conversation and in that in anything that's going on in the Erie County or or other uh, criminal justice facilities. What are some of the values that we want to see? Um, ref you you know oper operation operational values how they need to operate, how we need to operate. Um, so I was going to say one of the values that I definitely um, feel like need to be in 
the system and in this space and mm -hmm. and those of us who do this work is integrity um making sure that people are operating from a place of integrity and honesty is also very important um as far as a value um and almost an appreciation or respect for a person's humanity even if it's someone that doesn't look like you if it's someone that's not from where you're from if it's someone who has done something hurtful or harmful it doesn't matter because the truth is as human beings we all do hurtful harmful things all the time whether we acknowledge it recognize it or not and so that doesn't give another human being a right to disrespect dehumanize brutalize or be harmful to another human being in any other way so i would say integrity honesty and a true value for all people's humanity not just a few i just want to say preach <laughs> preach <laughs> you know so preach. true so so true uh deidre do you uh, want to offer a thought there yeah, I was just going to um, just just uh, the same as far as the remembering um, our human rights, our basic, very basic human rights, you know, food, shelter, clothing, um, the 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 right to um, just medical care and and health care and, and to be cared for as human being. Um, many, many human beings are in systems like this because they weren't cared for in the beginning um, because they came out of a broken family or a broken community. Um, so therefore they continue to break things and they continue to be broken. So, you know, it has to, the healing has to start somewhere and the, um, the, the wholeness and putting back together has to start somewhere, you know, and why not, you know, in facilities like these that can help them to um, become whole again. So, um, you know, just remembering our humanity, remembering, um, you know, to, to, to make ones that, you know, those who are broken, which is all of us really, um, but broken and in these particular systems of, uh, I will say, slavery, um, to, to help them to become whole again as much as we can in this particular system. Right, right. So mm -hmm. true. All of it. And and Cariel, are you able to um, to offer a, a value right now, or I don't know what's you know if you're free yet to 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 um, join in? She's probably in transition. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Vicky, if I sure. if I may, I would like to offer just one more. Sure, um, please. That aligns with. What Deidre, Deidre said. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Grace. Just simply right. grace. Um, extending grace to people. Mm -hmm. Because, like, we never know, right? We all have a story. We don't understand a person's story. Right. And hurt people tend to hurt people. Exactly. Um, and when you're broken and you're hurt and you, you respond that way. But sometimes you're not broken and you're hurt. Sometimes you just honestly make a mistake. Right. And I don't. there's not a human being on the face of the earth that I've ever met that has not honestly made a mistake somewhere in their life. And so we have to be willing to extend grace, um, the same grace that we want to receive. We have to be willing to extend to others. That's true. Right. So true. So true. So I, I would... You know, I, I always, <laughs> it's, it's so, it's such a wonderful part of the, of the show to me, um, the offering of these values. And so I think, you know, all of those are so important and really that, that, and all of them are based on love. You know, they're mm -hmm. all based on that one spirit. So when we feel it, and we don't always feel it, we can't always feel it, and sometimes it's too wishy-washy or it's, it's too far reach, and just respect, starting with respect. <clears throat> but in deeper, when we can go deeper, that love is there, and that one spirit is there, and that's it's when that one spirit has been hurt, as you were just saying. That's how we don't we can't connect to it. When we aren't able to feel that the other person, that we're part of it, 
you know, with them because we're so attending to our own hurt that we don't feel that connection. And yet, when we do break through and feel that connection, it can happen. It can happen so quickly. It can happen in ways that we can't imagine when we let it. And people are afraid to let it. You know, we learn not to let it. That's why children are so, so much more able to do it than we are. As we get older and we're more defensive and we're more fearful. And children mm -hmm. can do it, just do it very naturally. Mm -hmm. But anyway. anyway I think so I saw Carrie come off mute for a second. Oh, good. There she is. Yay. Yay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you want to add one more value before we go into what's going on? In the okay, whole what am I adding a value to? I'm sorry. Any any value you want to uphold of, of that in that uh, in 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 our work in our conversation? Um, I would like to uh, make sure that people are taken care of, and it's people over profits. Um, it seems that. Um, as far as the, the correctional facilities, they're not correcting anything or and they don't intend to correct any, anyone. Or I shouldn't say anything. They, they don't intend on correcting anyone um, because if they were, you have some people coming out with PhDs. That's where all the money should go into <laughs> education. So like go and put it into education, put it into um, job programs. So you know, it seems that these people are employable when they're in jail, but when they get out, then all of a sudden their record stops them from being employed. So that's a, that's, that's the perfect segue into let's talk about what's going on in the holding center. And that's what you've started doing mm -hmm. is that is, you know, so that's part of what's happening in the criminal justice system. So if you want to, let's talk a little bit about some of the recent incidents and sort of what's happened and, and um, what's happening. And, and then maybe we can pull into some of the work that's being done to change things. So, um, uh, Reverend Denise, do you, want to, do you want to start us off with just sort of an update on what happened and what's happening in terms of some of the inmates and, you know, the recent recent um, uh, specifics or and then we can get into more generally the, the holding center is as Carriel was saying the sort of modus operandi the way they just operate that is so well slavery as Deidre said you know we know the 13th amendment that says you know there's no slavery except if we manage to incarcerate mm -hmm. what mostly black and brown bodies you know but any or anyone that it's you know that's the the route to slavery but um so so uh, there was a there was some unrest in the holding center and then that led to a series of incidents and i know uh you especially um uh Bif bishop geneva cariel we at, at the western new york peace center many people have been working you know, cert certainly to try and change, um, to try and, and, and get to the bottom of what's going on and then help them make the changes that are immediate and also more general. So. I mean, unrest seems to be the uh, nature of our holding center over more than a decade, closer to two. And actually, um, just to honor the work that Carielle has done, I know that she was the first person that families contacted with the most recent uprising and unsettling um, disturbances to come out of the Erie County Sheriff's Department. And I say the Sheriff's Department because a lot of times we focus on the holding center because it's here in the city. Right. But this is happening throughout Erie County Sheriff's Department yeah. and Corrections Department. It's not... Um, isolated in the holding center. It's also in the Alden facility. Um, so I don't know, Cariel, do you want to take lead on talking about um, the most recent occurrences and then I can chime in or support? Well, I was contacted by um, the sister of um, a person that's incarcerated and um, 
he basically talked about being beat, um, not not eating properly, um, um, uh, broken bones. I'm not sure if he was the one that had the broken bones, but eventually more families started speaking up, and um, and this is what what the problems were, um, and also. Um, they were not getting their commissary um, or phone calls. Mm -hmm. They were, not, they were not, not being able to make phone calls, so uh, they couldn't tell people what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, somehow someone got, got, um, was able to, to get that word out, and actually one person even wrote a letter, you know, um, explaining what was going on. Um, and I felt that it was um, it was crucial to to like be there to let them know not only the inmates know that we know what was going on, but also the um, the uh, the workers at the correction facility, the right. officers. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did go there, and then we continued to go. Of course, um, then Geneva came into into town. I called Pastor Denise because I thought she had access to the um, um, to get into the correctional facilities. Um, I know Miles; he was able to get into Alden and he recognized that there were um, uh, a only a couple of people coming to to his his uh, religious class where there were like about twelve, fifteen, um, and it was down to two. So. That then everything made sense to him about why everything was was like it was. Um, so anyway, when we got there, um, you know, they were saying that they were not being supplied with um, anything to wash themselves or or, or to clean. Um, so anyway, afterwards, after we came there, like by the next week, you know, they were they were um, saying that the conditions were better. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a good thing that we did reach out. And then um, uh, Vicky, you and Geneva were able to get inside and to speak with with um, the brother of um, of uh, one of the people that complained. So um, that was good. You know, right. I, I understand how you and Geneva could get in. His own mom couldn't get in. But I was still grateful because at least someone... Um, was able to see him and then that could put him at ease to let him know that we knew what was going on and that, you know, we were there to help. So mm -hmm. um, it was basically was a collaborative effort. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody coming together for the common goal, which is how we should do things. And that's what happened. And, and now um, the last I heard, which maybe you may have more information because of course, then I started like working on other stuff too. Um, but the last I heard, the DOJ was, was in there. So maybe one of you can speak about that. Yeah. Um, so just to, in addition to uh, what Carrie all share, shared, so right. actually several weeks ago, uh, it was made very public that there was um, some things happening at Alden and the riot had broke out. Right. And it was publicized through jail management in a few entities that it was due to the removal of a microwave, which was removed due to um, incarcerated persons misconduct. Um, but we had been receiving phone calls that um, at Alden, they were already withholding visits. They were holding people's mail. They were um, keeping people from using their phone privileges. Um, and those were the things that escalated leading up to the riot that broke out at Alden. Um, at the time, it was a few folks making these acquisitions and anybody who's done any kind of organizing or activism work in the carceral system here in Erie County, it's very difficult to access Alden. Um, and so in the midst of trying to figure that out, um, several folks that were held at Alden that was said to be part of this were then transported to the holding center downtown because they were trying to break up the troublemakers, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. 
And then in that somewhere in that line of transport, all of a sudden similar complaints is what um, Carol ended up calling me saying, listen, do you have access because they're not giving them food? They're denying them visits even from um, faith leaders. And um, for some people, they, they were stalling visits with attorneys and, you know, they're not getting phone calls and they're not cleaning. And like she said, immediately, like different folks, her, Miles, myself, you know, making calls and other folks getting involved in Finally, Miles got granted a very, very brief visit um, with uh, a young man there, um, which led to more questions. And then, of course, um, once uh, Bishop Geneva was there and, you know, folks were able to get a, a televisit, getting a little more clarity. But it's an ongoing problem, right? Like, at the end of the day, um, we don't have the right to deny people their basic necessities, right? Hygiene right. products, right. a clean right. environment, uh, food, right? Um, and they certainly shouldn't be being cut off from their family. We all know that um, halt has passed. And so there's an end to solitary confinement. And so then why are we now calling it by another name, but yet still in all confining people into solitude and not giving them access to their family or loved ones or their legal representation, or um, their spiritual leadership, right? This is a problem. And so, yeah, so what Carol said, like, everybody coming together, responding, reacting, showing up, showing up boldly and loudly. Um, now, uh, the Attorney General's office is involved, and the Department of Justice is back involved, and things are moving, Um I just personally feel like it's a shame um, that, yeah, we have to do the, we, we have to take such drastic measures to get people's humanity respected. Like we shouldn't be having to do this just to make sure that you feed people every day. I know now that those entities are involved, uh, phone privileges have been restored. Folks actually now are out of solitary confinement. Visits have been restored. And so, yes, there, there's there been some light in this. But I think the larger conversation is what needs to happen policy-wise, transparency-wise, and accountability-wise to ensure that they don't do this again, that no one else is stripped of their basic rights and necessities again um in our county by our sheriff's department and corrections office here and so what what do we need to be doing what needs to be put in place um so that we're making sure that that work is being done because the way that these individuals are have been treated is is beyond horrific and the truth is if any one of us were to do some of the things that they're doing to these individuals we then would also be being detained in Absolutely. the holding center, right? Like if my kids upset me and I withhold dinner from them for a week, somebody's calling CPS, right? Somebody's trying to charge me with child endangerment or cruelty to children, right? There's a consequence. And so why, if there's a consequence for all of us, is there not a consequence to those that we entrust our loved ones to when they go into these systems to ensure that they are still maintaining their humanity and their basic needs of well-being. Um, and so I think that that's really become the larger conversation, as well as making sure that while we're trying to figure that out, um, things are put in place to keep these individuals safe and their needs met in the in-between time. There's such a lot to do, and it sort of seems to me as if there's, you know, as you're saying, there's sort of two, two different levels of it. And one is just to make sure that, that these horrific things that are illegal and immoral um, that are being done or not done, right, in terms of medical care, in terms of, 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 of adequate food and and uh, cleaning, basic cleaning supplies and things like that, not being uh, incarcerated, not being um, held in solitary, et cetera. Um, but the other is also just the whole concept of the criminal justice system in this country, the way it's been practiced, 
is so misguided and so counterproductive. And all of the results show us that. So we, so we need the change to see that they're not absolutely doing crimes in there. But then we also need the changes that are just, you know, the, the racism that's so involved in the system, the, 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 the misguided thing of like crushing, per, uh, crushing a person and also ca uh, capitalizing on the person. Both those things are going on in the system as it stands in normal mm -hmm. operating procedures. That's the norm, you know. Um, so, so those two levels. So the first thing is the, the first thing would be the thing that we need to work on first to make sure they're not, that they're actually getting at least those minimal things going on. So I, 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 maybe if we want to switch gears a little bit here, too, about the families. And we did say we want to focus on the families. Um, and, and, and back to there's those two aspects again. It's like, do they get to actually have visits with their families now? Or what kind of visits and what kind of conditions? And then, two, you know, how are they, how, how is that allowed to foster, you know, the whatever healthy healing kinds of um, experiences that help people into another, you know, if there has been a problem, you know, to find another way. So those are sort of two different levels because the families, you know, when they say, you know, the family also does the time. And families are the best way to reaching through to the person. So it's right. just such a lot, such a lot that needs to be done. Although I'm, I'm encouraged that some of those things have been happening now. Um, oh, and I did hear today. So we have a regular, you know, some, I, I, I think you all, certainly you all know, and many of the listeners will know that um, there's a regular vigil um, that uh, uh, Chuck Culhane, who's the chair of the piece of the, Prisoners' Rights Task Force of the Western New York Peace Center has been holding that down. It was it was also started off with um, prisoners or people too, and other groups. And certainly, Voice has lots of times uh, contributed, or even you know had a special time at that time, or other times too. But anyway, um, so they were there today because today is Wednesday as we're t as we're taping or pre-taping this. And uh, mm -hmm. Chuck mentioned to me that Monica Lynch, who will be there when we have this special um, fa Focus on Families event at the Holding Center at quarter of noon qu at 11.45 <clears throat> a.m. on Friday, um, that he and she were there and they saw a number of the people in the um, Correction Specialist Advisory Board um, going, in, going into the facility to the Erie County Holding Center. So I felt like that is a good piece of news. That would only be to the good, because I know Heron Simmons, who's been, he was the person we um, nominated to be on that committee, said he's never, he's never even been in there. And so if they're starting to let them in and give them more information about what's going on, that would be a huge help. Transparency. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Yeah, I I think that um, uh, in in focusing on the families, we have to even though these are individuals that are um, in prison and in the holding center, there are our mothers, fathers, there are sisters and our brothers, our children, and they you know whatever they did, whatever law they broke, they weren't always like that, you know. Um, or they, or, or it was a mistake or, you know, maybe, you know, something else happened, but they found themselves in that particular facility. And, um, and yes, the children, and yes, families do suffer and children, if they can go see their parents in the holding center, um, it's a, it's an experience that you don't forget. You know, I have those particular experiences where I visited my mother in the holding center and how much I had to go through just to see her for 20 minutes, you know, um, or less than that because I was underage. Um, and what I had to go through to see her in Alden, 
um, and what I need to go through as a teenager to just see her there um, and her and, and the dignity that she felt was stripped away from me just seeing her in that space. So it's a lot of um, uh, a compromise of dignity, integrity of the inmate. They're already humbled by the experience of being a facility. Then their family seeing them that way. Their mothers, you know, and their children seeing them that way. Um, you know, we have to remember to, to you know, there's hope. Where, where there's life, there's hope. You know, and uh, I know some people are, you know, will say, well, you know, they're in there for a reason. Whatever they get, they got coming to them, you know, and I, I I hear that. I, you know, I get it as far as the justice, whatever they did to other people. But as far as being a facility, that's the punishment, you know, that you remove from society. However, you know, we have to understand that we have to fight against cruel and unusual punishment, you know, and that is the law you know, that, that, that should not happen, you know, in these so-called facilities. Um, so, you know, just as far as families, yes, you know, families are affected for life, you know. And well, I think in, oh, no, go ahead. I was, was going to say, I think in, in, in having conversations where we're focusing on the families, right, mm -hmm. again, from my organizing hat, right, what policies, what reform, what procedures do we need to put in place that will ensure and hold them accountable um, for what's being done to families? And it's very unfortunate because our uh, criminal justice system is a system that consistently destroys families, in which times is what actually is the cause of a lot of the individuals who end up in there. Sure. I can't tell you the number of, of folks that I counsel who they are the child of an incarcerated parent and now they're incarcerated and their parent was the child of an incarcerated parent. And that's how their parent got incarcerated. Right. And, and part of that is because of how this system operates. And it's true that the entire, when one person in the family is incarcerated and doing time, the entire family is doing time. And so then when we have these facilities that then strip away visits, strip away phone calls, strip away, um, the, the ability to receive and send mail, right? Mm -hmm. Even just mentally, the toll that that takes on both sides. But we have to think in Erie County, the last death that happened in the holding center, they waited two weeks to release the name of the person who had passed away. So, so that is not honoring a person, nor is it honoring their family because now what happens is Family people know someone has passed away. If you have a loved one in that facility, now you're left to wonder. I haven't heard from them, and it's not like you could just call there and be like, "Hey, let me talk to my brother. Let me talk to my son. Let me talk to my cousin." It doesn't work that way, right? And so that system, and a lot of times we have used phrases like, "Oh, it's broken." System's not broken. System operates the way it was designed to operate, and the way it operates takes and strips the humanity and the dignity away from people. And then when it's ready, it spits them back into society and say, pull yourself up, get yourself together, perform this way. And when they can't do it, they act like they weren't the cause of what stripped their dignity and their humanity away That's from true. them. How as a parent, if your humanity and your dignity has been stripped from you, do you come home and step up and perform as a parent, as a husband, as a wife, as a sister, as a mother? It's very right. difficult. So then what happens, guilt sets in, shame sets in, inadequacy and insecurity set in. And then you find yourself contemplating or struggling with the very things that put you in the position to be where you are right now. And it perpetuates a cycle of behavior. It perpetuates patterns that people get stuck in and don't really know how to break because we haven't put the proper resources and supports in place to make sure that when they come home, they get what they need. Right. right? And so, and, and so it's just acknowledging those things and acknowledging that it operates the way it's supposed to, to operate, acknowledging that we know that the supports probation, parole, that sh are supposed to help people find employment, make sure they get housing, make sure they do these things. Yeah, but they also get bonuses when you recidivize. 
So how hard am I going to work to ensure you're thriving in society if my paycheck increases if you mess up? And so we can't talk about the families without talking about the things that are intentionally in place systemically that are designed to harm and break these families so that they don't get whole. So then as community, what is our moral and righteous obligation to make sure that we are making the demands of the changes and the shifts in policy so that this can no longer operate this way? This can no longer break and destroy our community family structure, right? And then what things can we do on our own? So there's talks of, and there's been lots of movement in restorative justice and restorative practices. Where as community, can we implement those things so that before I'm calling the police on my neighbor's son because he broke in my car, I'm able to come into community with them and in relationship with them and say, what is needed here so that you don't feel like you need to do these things and this is what I need so that you can make right what has now hurt my family and we can move forward together, right, in community. And so when we want to focus on families, we also have to focus on the systemic things that are happening that are breaking apart and destroying and harming these families. And, you know, to that I want to add, and it's interesting to me that neither of you, and in fact, all three of you as women of color, are not saying this, but I'm the one who's going to say it. How often is the system just plain wrong and criminal itself? So that the person didn't even do the thing that they were tra- that they're being charged with doing. That they're st- and then and then and then there's the the because there's no good lawyers because the, uh, the, because the person doesn't have money for the that they can buy their way out either through bail through a good lawyer or whatever it is, then they're stuck in there, languishing in there. Then they have a public defender who had that, who just comes in fresh, doesn't know anything because they're way overwhelmed in terms of case level and everything else. So there's all these other things. I want to say that I am appalled and I have been calling and I will call him out right now, District Attorney Flynn. So it's not just broken the, 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 the holding center, which is merely for people who are being held, not who have been convicted, but also Mm -hmm. that here is this two cops who were clearly lying and wrong in every kind of step on the way uh, in the way with the Morgan Eaton case that is well publicized in the Buffalo News. And they say, well, we can't really prove that they were lying and that they don't remember, even though everything points to that they were lying, that they were lying. And if it's so every day that you have, that you take a, take a, that you test something and then say that it was legal drugs when it wasn't, if that's so every day that you don't even remember doing it, that would be just as bad problem to me. But anyway, that 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 they don't get a break. But here, Deanna Davis, who clearly didn't know what she was doing, um, was, you know, was coming home from a funeral, found herself in a war zone, had some people in the car, had some problems with a problematic uh, ex or soon to be ex-husband and some of his friends who were a little you know, maybe, maybe shady in some kind of way. So she is a victim and she was, you know, and she, not that, that back to what you said, no, not, no one, we're not talking about perfection here, but we're talking about a clear accident and they're making a federal case out of it. Literally, literally, she doesn't get cut a break. She gets, they know that she did the wrong thing on purpose, that she clearly ran. T- no, it was, it was, you know, all kinds of, uh, tear gas and everything else. So, I mean, the broken system that incarcerates people because of mental health problems, because of poverty, because of um, uh, 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 substance abuse, Mm -hmm. that also factors in. So, Cariel, yeah, Mm Cariel, please. (laughs) Yeah, so when we talk about the system, um, back when... um, um, she, Deanna Davis did drive through, uh-huh. uh, when she drove through, I was out there that day mm-hmm. and it was caught up in, in the traffic. So I, um, <clears throat> first of all, the issue was police violence. Right. And right. The solution, 
their solution was to bring out oops their solution was to bring out more officers in riot gear to deal with peaceful protesters they were the ones that were out there shooting the tear gas and the rubber bullets it wasn't it wasn't the um the protesters um so it's like they come and they make a situation worse um and then how right. do you stop police violence with more police violence like right. that it doesn't even make sense but that's what they were doing and i blame the mayor the current mayor um for that because he brought in um the state troopers and i guess there was national guard national guards there also mm -hmm. right um, Right. Yes. So, mm -hmm. But to bring, but to bring them in to solve the the problem of police violence was just crazy. He was supposed to get the community to get together right. and work it out that way. But sometimes they, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Um, I mean, for them, it it, it makes sense, but it's all common sense. Right. It's like if we say stop beating us, stop killing us. You don't go get more police officers to beat and kill us. No, oh, that's right. crazy. Right. And then when they got ran over, then they want to say, "Oh, now we want to make a federal case against her." But well, what about the federal case against police mm -hmm. for the violence in the first place that even caused um, those officers to be out there? Yeah. And if you ask me, in my opinion, sometimes they perpetuate these types of stories and this violence, right? Because they need to justify their own actions, they need to justify their decision-making. And so they look for scapegoats. Like I think about stories like the Exonerated Five, five young men right. who spent a good chunk of their life in prison because they were framed for a crime that they never committed. And there was not even any real clear evidence to really lock them into this, but they needed to close this case because there was pressure, right? And how many right. stories like that do we hear? And if these are the ones we hear, imagine how many stories like that, that we never hear, that we never know of, right? right. And so again, it's, and, and it goes back to things like what Kiriel said in the beginning, like when are we gonna place people over profit? We, we invest so much money into our policing, into our prisons and our jails. We don't even invest that kind of money into education. And for a lot of the adults in the system, they started as the children in the system who ended up in a situation. And instead of us investing in them, instead of us showing up for them, we left them broken, we left them hurting, and now they're the adults in our carceral system. And that's a problem. That's a problem for me. Right. And so, again, if we're talking about honoring these families, then we have to think about that. Like, where are we failing children and young adults when a 16 year old? Yes, maybe they get caught up in an armed robbery situation and someone dies. And that's horrible. And it's sad. Right. And it's difficult and it's hurtful. But does that mean that we take 30 years of that 16 year old's life? Is, is, is that truly the response to this? And what does that do? to a family right? when of, we do that. Of course, it is just wrong in every kind of way. And um, back to, I, I just have to mention the, uh, the um, Buffalo Five. You know, I can't miss the opportunity to mention the Buffalo Five, which are the five, you know, um, being uh, uh, John Walker, being one of them, Daryl uh, Boyd, um, and anyway, these five, as, as young teens, were all, you know, accused of murdering somebody that it was, there was clear evidence that they hadn't done it. And that case has still not been made right. And the reasons why, back to District Attorney, back to what you said about the cover-up or the justification, because if people have done things wrong or let things slide with no evidence or even clear evidence that somebody else did it, which actually, first of all, one of those five was found not guilty because they got a good lawyer. The good lawyer proved that they hadn't done it, and that didn't follow through to the other cases, which, of course, it should have, and they have still not been acquitted or you know, exonerated. So it's just back to, 
you know, the craziness of this system and the racism in this system. So that's the other thing. The racism and the uh, um, elitism or whatever you want to call. Classism. So, classism. Classism. Thank you. That's a better word for it. So the classism and the... Um, and the, uh, the, the racism are very clear as well because it's not just anybody who becomes, I don't say there's impossible that there's the odd case where somebody, you know, who, who was uh, either, either white or upper class or something didn't get treated wrongfully or something. And plus we said it's already an unhealthy system to start with. We, you know, um, but anyway, that there, it's just, it's very clear that the racism is 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 pronounced and that the way people are treated differently is very pronounced it's pronounced you know in in those kinds of ways and what to speak when you start talking about police officers or people who are within the system where at their 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 crimes are covered up what are ignored denied and covered up mm -hmm. so Anyway, the, the, so getting back to the, the holding center a little bit, which I know I brought us out into the, the larger criminal justice system, but let's just go back to the case where people did make a mistake, right? And, oh, I just they're, do they're, need to mention that a lot of times people did this much and they get charged with this much. That's another thing that happens a lot, right? So it's made into more than it is or other things get piled on top of it. Back to because it is a profit-oriented system or a jobs program in some communities. So... Cariel has her hand up. Oh, she, well, I don't know. Yeah, is it still up, Cariel? It's up before. Yeah, I raised it again. I raised sure. it. Sure, please, please. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. You don't need so, to just start um, talking. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, base, um, the system that we um, currently have mm -hmm. needs to be revamped. Um, that's why I would like to work on legislation because, um, mm -hmm. uh, the system is, is, I would say outdated, um, because it's illegal from the beginning. And I say that it's illegal from the beginning because like I said, if it's a correctional facility, you would think people would come out corrected. Um, and then even felons wouldn't have to live the rest of their life for whatever crime they committed, which Seems like cruel and unusual punishment, which is against the Constitution, right? You're not right. supposed to get cruel and unusual, unusual right. punishment. Right. But if, you, yeah. if you've done your time, then why would you still have to stay in jail? And then for some people who didn't commit the crime and they were in jail for it, and they get denied parole because they won't say that they committed something that they didn't commit. And so they go back to jail for more years and then get denied the next time because they still won't admit to a crime that they didn't do. Um, mm. So it's like, um, even though they may not have any problems in jail whatsoever, it's just that they will not admit to doing something that they did not do. So they continue to, to go back to jail. Um, so... The system is outdated. It's wrong. Um, it, it's really all about common sense. And for me, it's it's like um, just not even instead of going through um, pulling the wool over somebody's head, it is what it is. It's like if I like these young boys, for instance, they're out here shooting people carrying guns and and they carry the guns because otherwise they're going to be shot mm. and they go to jail and how is that correcting them they these boys are young they don't have any any good influences around them um so or they have so much peer pressure that they don't listen to the good influence um so then they go to jail and there's nothing there to help build them up so that they can come out and be productive citizens. They come back out to nothing. And that's the revolving door of the criminal justice system because everybody in the criminal justice system is getting paid from them. So we need to um, write legislation, push legislation, push common sense, because that's all it is. It is. It's common sense. Um, 
common sense legislation and um, reform the system. And it's time to just stop letting them treat people like animals for profit. Right. Right. Are you are you um, advocating for like um, uh, like a no prison system, like a completely alternative type of correctional um, type system? I definitely um, don't like the, the prison system the way it is now um, because people are caged up like animals. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, there's another way to do it. There's plenty of different ways to do it. Yes. And anyone that tells you that a, a human being needs to be caged up. I mean, you have some violent offenders. Don't get me wrong, but there's still a way to deal with them. If you have a violent offender who is um, deemed to be um, uh, having, having like psychological issues, and you put them in a, a in a, um, a, um, facility, mm -hmm. you're going to deal with them differently than you. I mean, you, you're going to have them behind locked doors, but you're not necessarily going to have them in, a, in like um, cages behind bars. So if you can deal with a violent offender in that way, then then you can deal with um, a violent offender um, sort of kind of the same way. They, they okay. still would be behind closed doors and locked doors or whatever, but it's a different way that they, a different approach that you can do so that they won't feel like nothing. That's and basic. I, they want cr criminals. I mean, criminals. They want people to feel like they want them to feel like they're nothing. Like if you committed a crime, then you're like the, the, the worst of the worst. And, and we're only as strong as our weakest link. So if we throw them away, we just as well throw ourselves away. And the truth is, there's a lot of models in all over the of ways of doing right. it differently. Absolutely. I think that we need to explore some of these other models. And I completely agree with Carriel. Like, there's a difference between it, it. If if you treat someone a certain way their entire life, you cannot be surprised when they show up that way. Right. right? Right. And so when we put people in cages and we strip them of their humanity and their dignity, and then we act like we're surprised when they no longer know how to operate in relationship with other people, th that should not be a surprise. We've done that. Right. We've we've created that. Right? right. And so even like she said, if there is a violent offender, there are other ways and other methods in working with someone who has committed a crime of violence that is still more restorative, that is right. still um, done in a way where, yes, they are paying their debt for whatever it is that they've done wrong, but we're not stripping them down so much so that they're no longer of any good to themselves or society. And that's what the current criminal justice system is doing, right? And so it's looking at some of that. I think it's us looking and redefining as a people what public safety needs to look like. Right. And what we need for the public to actually be safe. And why is it that more policing or more type of militarized or policing equipment is what's needed in order to create safety in community? Is that really what we need? Or is that what it's being projected that we need, right? So that they can justify doing the things that are being done systemically, which keeps the classism, which perpetuates the racism and the oppression and the hate that we see show up in communities. And so it, I think it's the same thing for our prison system. It's redefining what it looks like to be accountable for our actions and to restore the harm that's been done. And I, I, I don't care what anybody says. If you do something in your teen years or in right. your 20s, it doesn't take me 30 years to realize I got that wrong. No, no. Okay? No. Like, it, right. I am not the same person I was at 15 now. Right. I'm not the same person I was five years ago. Right. Now. Right. Right. And so what 
what is it about our criminal justice? Well, we know what it is, right? Because we know what it derives from. And that whole system comes out of hate. That whole system came out of oppressing and enslaving people. And now what's happened is now we have a legal way to oppress and enslave people. Right. Even though they still operate with a lot of illegal tactics. So I think it's reimagining what's needed for public safety, reimagining what's needed to hold people accountable in their actions. And I'm not saying that horrific things don't happen every day as a person who my brother was executed in this city brutally. I, I, that was horrific and it was traumatizing for my family. Um, But do I want to see that person locked in a cage and brutalized with no humanity and no dignity? No, because what good does that do anyone? You You understand? My brother's already gone. Right. So by now doing something horrific to the person who harmed him, what have we accomplished? We haven't accomplished anything. There's there's nothing in that that's going to make me feel better about the loss of my brother. But what would make me feel better about the loss of my brother is to see this individual fully restored. Right. To see this individual be able to rationalize what they did and why they did it and what they need in that. Right. Right. And to understand the harm that was caused by that. That's what would help. So I I hate to say, you know, our time is up, but I couldn't be more grateful. I couldn't be more touched or more um, determined. We've talked about other ways that people can help. So I'd say uh, if you go on, uh, uh, there's a there's a, a vigil on Friday, the 25th at 1145 in front of the holding center that will focus on families and we'll hear from family members. Um, and also after that, at one o'clock, Voice Buffalo is holding a faith leaders caucus on these issues about tangible changes that we can make and go to Voice Buffalo's um, website to find out more. In the meanwhile, I am so grateful to all of you, she rose. Um, beloved she rose and uh, we're in this together and we're we, we've been talking peace and we are and together we are talking peace in truth and love thank you so much oh my heart thank you, yeah. thank you so much for your time and energy tonight you know it's late and you know, you know, the, the cause never sleep. <laughs> no, no. And people are, you know, um, and I know people are tired and it's so much to keep giving and giving. So I'm mm-hmm. just grateful for you all. And uh, we'll just keep right on together. And um, oh, and Geneva wasn't able to log on. She was trying to get onto the Facebook and then or, or onto the okay. Zoom and somehow it wasn't working. So. We have some things to figure out. It was very wonky today, but I couldn't be more grateful to all three of you. And uh, Deidre, I know, because Deidre, yeah, you all, well, each one of you are giving so much in a special way. So So we're onward. Onward. So get a good night's sleep, everybody. (laughs) So much. Yeah. Keep a balance. Thank you. Big hugs and love. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all so much. Big hug. Thanks. Sleep well. Good night. Thanks, Jillian. Mm -hmm. More to follow. Love you. Thanks, Cariel. Good night.